So, you know, I'm always appreciative of the ark of worship. And if any of you have ever observed the ark of worship, what I mean by that is that usually at the beginning of worship, there is this time of praise for us. And that ark is to encourage us to forget about what we've come from and to bring us into the very presence of God. And that ark of worship enables us then to empty ourselves of all of the things that we perhaps have brought into this place so that we might be able to be undone, to be, we might be able to come into the sovereign presence because it really is a process for us. And I want to tell you, it's always exciting for me watching people in worship. I love watching the praise group. Um, I couldn't help but watch Ethan as he was uh, doing that little string interlude right then and just watching, he had his eyes closed and you could tell that he was really touching something within him. Some people get that through music. Some people get it through the written word. Some get it through prayer. Wherever you are this evening, you're in the right place because you're able to access that divine that is within you right where you are this evening. And on the front row, this, there was, we were worshiping, I, I noticed there were a couple of arms with our arms fully up in the air, and then I, I looked over at my, uh, my Roman Catholic charismatic friend, and she was on her knees bowing down, and, uh, and, and Reverend Todd had just sat down for a moment and just uh, held his hands open. I want to encourage us, as we come into this ark of worship, whichever day we come in, whether it's on a Wednesday or a Sunday, that you take ownership of your worship. And if that means that you want to stand and put your arms in the air, or if you want to sit quietly, or if you want to go and kneel at the, the altar to Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, whatever it is that you need to do to get into that place of the divine so that we are open and ready to receive the good news for ourselves individually, I want to encourage you to do that. There is no one way of worship, and there is no one right way or wrong way of connecting with the divine that's inside you. So I pray that as we have sung this night, that we've prepared our hearts and minds now to hear and to be at that place where we may be able to hear God this night. So let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for the ark of worship and we're so thankful for the way in which you lead us gently by your spirit. And so it is at this moment, God, that we ask that you would open our hearts and minds so that we might hear you once again in that voice that speaks to us individually and as a church and that through that voice that we hear, that we might therefore follow as you lead. Encourage us, O oh God, to take, take the divine within us, that presence of the holy within us, seriously, so that we might open ourselves afresh and anew, that we might be undone from all of the, the stuff of the world, undone so that we might be ready to be made whole again together as the body of Christ. And now we pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this night. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the Christ in whom we pray. Amen. So as uh, Reverend Aaron said at the beginning of worship, over the next few weeks we're going to be doing a series of sermons under this title. It's called God of the Underdogs. Uh, when the odds are against you, God is for you. And over the next four weeks, we're going to look at some of the, perhaps some of the characters of the Scripture, um, or perhaps characters of our world, that some might consider underdogs. And how we examine those underdogs, how we understand those underdogs, and how in some ways we've made them the heroes of our world. And we're going to take an opportunity to think about how we as individuals have often seen ourselves or others have seen us as the underdog in the world. And yet, if we truly believe in the Word of God who says that I will take the things of the, f the wise and make them foolish and the things of the fools and make them confound the wise, then we know that God is for us, even at the margins of our society. I want to read a scripture for you. It's inside your order of worship if you want to follow along with me. It's from Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58, and it's the prophet without honor, and you may have heard these words before. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, Jesus began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did Jesus get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this Mary and Joseph's son, and aren't his brothers and sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in their own town and in their own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of the lack of their faith. 
So Jesus had uh, just come back to his hometown. Now you need to understand what he was doing before this. Uh, Jesus had just come back from what we might call a mission trip, a bit like our youth have just come back from Orlando. Uh, they were able to have that opportunity where they could leave the place that they were well known and be able to recreate themselves in a whole new place. They went off to Orlando and they went to do some mission trip, well, a bit like Jesus. Jesus had been off in the Decapolis, had been doing miracles and wonders. News about Jesus had been reaching all of the, the corners of their own particular world as they understood it to be. Uh, they'd realized that this man was able to do miracles. He'd raised people from the dead. He'd fed the 5,000, the 40,000. He had done all of these wonderful, wonderful miracles. Uh, Jesus was riding a high. Ever, ever had an opportunity in your own life when things just seem to be going so right for you? Oh, please say somebody in this congregation knows the time when everything seemed to be going just right for you. Amen. And everything just seemed to, you know, those moments where you just can't put a foot wrong. You know, you think that you're about to do something, you're going to fall off a cliff, and even then, something miraculous happens out of those moments. And it just seems like you're riding this cloud. I always tell people that when you enter into a new congregation, especially as a pastor, uh, you have what they call this honeymoon period, and it seems like you can almost do nothing wrong. You know, you have this honeymoon period, and you ride that wave as long and as fast as you can. Because you know that it, there will come a time in the not too distant future, and perhaps it's already happened, when you know when you, <laughs> when you will do something and then suddenly you're just another human being, just like everybody else. But you know there's those moments in our lives, and Jesus had just had this moment in his life when just everything seemed to be going right. You know, he'd been very quiet about who he was. He'd been very quiet about what he'd been called to. He'd been very quiet in his own experience. He allowed other people to say that he was the Messiah. He allowed other people to report about the great things that were happening because of his presence in the world. And Jesus had been riding high on this wonderful, wonderful cloud of great success, raising people from the dead. He had been doing such incredible mission work. And now it was time for him to go home, perhaps to touch base again with his own family and with his own realities. And Jesus gets home to this group of people that he grew up about. He grew up in the presence of these people. Now, the scriptures say that his brothers and sisters were there, and I know that some of us question, well, does Jesus really have literal brothers and sisters? Well, uh, we believe that Jesus did have some literal brothers and sisters, and they were still living in the hometown with, with Mary and, uh, uh, and, and were living there and, and had been very observant in the synagogue. That was their place of worship, and people knew about Jesus, but they'd also been hearing all of these rumors about Jesus. So you can imagine that they were pretty curious about what Jesus had been doing everywhere else but not had been doing in his own hometown. And so Jesus returns to this experience and to this environment and suddenly realizes that everybody in his hometown doesn't see Jesus the way that everybody outside of his hometown sees him. Everybody in his hometown sees him as the little boy that grew up and that got lost at the temple. Everybody sees him as that, that little Mary and Joseph's young lad who, who sat around with his parents and watched his father perhaps carve some things as a carpenter. Everybody in that hometown remembers him as the, the stubbling little kid that probably couldn't learn to ride his tricycle as quickly as everybody else did. You get the picture? Of course, they didn't perhaps have tricycles in those days. I'm just trying to bring it up to date for us. But, you know, all of us, all of us know that, you know, people have these memories of us. You know, when I first became a pastor in Great Britain, there was a, a woman in my congregation. I've told you the story before about the woman who took me out to dinner after I preached, but I didn't tell you this about her. She knew my mom when I was a baby. And when we first got together, she said, she was very, very good about this. She, she told me, she said, yep, she said, there's not much you can tell me about you and your family because I remember changing your diapers when you was a little baby. And now I'm the one who's supposed to be the preacher uh, in her church. And, uh, you know, she said to me, she, 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 there's some reality that whenever we go home, whenever we go back to the familiar, whenever we go back to these places, no matter who we are in the rest of the world, we're not quite that when we're at home. We're not quite the, the person who's made all the, the great achievements or the, the person who's made the great advances in our lives. That's what Jesus was experiencing when he got home that day. He wanted to be able to perform all these miracles for his friends and for his family and for all his close ones, but for them, he was not the great Messiah. He was just Mary and Joseph's kid. He was the simple Jesus who had grown up amongst them and around them. 
He was considered not a messiah, but a bit of an underdog. He was seen as someone who, who, who had, they'd heard great stories about, but this couldn't be the Jesus that they knew from childhood. There are characters like this throughout Scripture who have gone on to do great things, who have gone on to do miraculous events in their lives, and they are always considered in their hometown that one without honor. I know that the kids, when they were off to Orlando and they met with all those other kids and they were there and they were doing their mission trip, I know that they were different there, because Alan's reported on some of this, they were different there (laughs) than they are when they're at home. But I also know that they've come back to us with a, a sense of pride and with a sense of achievement and with a sense of hope that perhaps they might be able to make a difference, not just in Orlando, but also here in Dallas. Jesus is always on the side of the underdog. He is always on the side of those who are sitting at the edges of society. If you look at Jesus' ministry, not only was he considered an underdog because he didn't conform to all of the religious rules and regulations of his day, Jesus was always confronting those religious responsibilities, those religious rights of his day. But Jesus went to the very edges of society and met with those who were lost, met with those who were considered less than, met with those who were considered to be on the outside of the world. Indeed, Jesus is often seen on the edges of society, seen on the edges of people's lives, people who would no longer be considered clean, but would be considered unclean. Read the stories of Jesus, and you will see Jesus touching lepers, something that you were never allowed to do, something that would make you ceremonially unclean. Jesus, who would sit at the well with the woman, who no longer could meet with even other women at the very beginning of the day, but had to go to the well at the noontime, the hottest time of the day. And Jesus would would sit with her and ask her her story. Jesus, who would tell the parables of the rich ruler who wanted to invite all of those who were well-known in society, and every time that he made an invitation to them, they made an excuse why they couldn't come. And then the parable of Jesus who said, go out and just find anybody in the highways and the byways, no matter where they are, on the edges of the world and invite them in and bring them to the table. Jesus was always on the side of the underdog. He was always on the side of the marginalized. He was always confronting the prejudices and the discrimination and the bigotry that existed 2,000 more years ago, and Jesus invites us today to also confront the wicked and bring to them a sense of what Jesus' purpose and mission was. I know that when I go home, as much as my family loves seeing me when I get back to Great Britain every other year, I know that I'm not the prophet with honor there in the same way that I am seen elsewhere. And Jesus invites us tonight to, to consider ourselves and to consider where we are in our, in our own ministry. Our Cathedral of Hope, a, a place that, that will sit with the underdog, are we a place that will truly live out this ministry of Jesus and go into the highways and to the byways and to reach out to people on the margins of society? Or are we a church that, that only welcome in those who have got some standing and some status in the world? The ministry of Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ has always to be on the margins of society, to welcome in the underdog, or perhaps those who consider themselves the underdog. Because the miracle of Jesus' ministry is he takes those who consider themselves without honor, those who consider themselves on the margins, those who consider themselves to be the underdog, and he turns our life into something which is glorious and victorious and magic and magical. That's what Jesus does for each and every one of us. No matter where we find ourselves on life's journey, we are welcome in this place. And we are welcome so that our lives can be transformed. And in that transformation process, 
We are told, we are encouraged not to see ourselves as anything better than those who are now on the margins, but rather to take our experience and take it to the next margin and to the next margin and to the next margin so that we can finally bring to the table all those who have been considered or all those who have felt like they were the underdog themselves. You see, friends, our experience of life is not something to be ashamed of. Our experience in this life is something that we get to lift up as a gift. And it's through that experience that other people who who have felt like they're the underdog, other people who have felt like they aren't welcome, other people who have felt like they have done something so bad in their lives that they could never be acceptable to Jesus. And we get to go alongside them and say, you think that's bad? You should hear my story. (laughs) And yet... Even in the midst of our own story, Jesus now encourages us to welcome the stranger, to stand on the margins. If the church is at the center, it's in the wrong place. The church is always called to the margins. The church is always called to the margins of society and to live in the mess of that experience. And yet the church today has become so comfortable with its status and with its glory and with its alliances instead of realizing that when Jesus came to this earth, when Jesus continues to make revelation to us, that our mission and our purpose is always to keep looking to the margins, to keep looking to the places where people are disenfranchised, to keep looking to the places because in truth, that is where real church happens. That's where real church happens in the messiness of life, in the messiness of circumstances, in the messiness of who we think we are. That's where church really happens. And if it is all just about the hurrah and the the big noise and the big celebrations, if it's really all about that, then we have missed what the ministry of Jesus to the underdogs is. The ministry of the underdogs is really to get our feet dirty, to get our hands dirty, to find the undone in us, and in that undone find the miracle of healing. That's what Jesus was doing in the miracles. It wasn't just about raising people from the dead. It was giving people a word of encouragement. That was a miracle. It was feeding people who didn't have any food. It was encouraging people on life's journey and telling people and letting them know that their lives were worth something, that their lives were worth the miracle. There is not one of us in this church this night who doesn't deserve God's grace and God's love. Oh, it's not earned, but it is something that is given to us free and without condition. It's that freedom. It's the freedom of God's love. It's the freedom of God's love and God's grace. Not that we earn it, but that it's a given gift for us. And that given gift is a gift that we then get to re-gift and to re-gift and to re-gift to everyone around us. Jesus wanted to do that for his friends and his family in his hometown, and he got to do just a little. But there were others who would come after Jesus into his hometown, representing Jesus, and would be able to be that messenger to them. You and I, when we go back out into the world, we get to gift and re-gift God's love to those around us to those who are in desperate need of a touch, those who are in a desperate need, who, who, sudden, who somehow believe, and I know that we've perhaps said this ourselves, that if they were to walk into a church today, the, the thunderclouds would clap and the lightning would hit and the church building would be destroyed because they are unworthy of God's love. We don't believe that here at Cathedral of Hope. We don't believe. We believe that everybody is worthy to be in this place. Everybody is worthy to be in this place. Not one person is less worthy than the other. That's the great gift that we get acknowledging that God and Jesus is always on the side of the underdog. I pray, Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ, that we might continue to always experience the places where the church is most active. And it's sometimes not active in the building. It's active in the ministries that we do. 
It's active in the ministries that we get to be a part of. It's active when we stand at City Hall on Monday and speak out for immigrants and for undocumented workers who continue to live in shame and guilt here in the United States in fear of their lives. It's with our transgender community who, who, who in, in, in just trying to find their own identity and just trying to live out the fullness of their reality get shamed, lose their jobs, their homes. It's standing with our transgender sisters and brothers and giving them a hand up and giving them encouragement and knowing that they have a place to worship here at Cathedral of Hope. That's where the work of the church is. It's reaching out and, and giving God thanks for the great achievements that have been made in civil rights in this world, but knowing that until all are free, none are free. And using our privilege to acknowledge and to help others find their justice in the world. That's where the church of Jesus Christ is most active. And our worship, our worship is just an opportunity for us to connect with the divine so that in the connecting of the divine within us and the divine in others, we're able to go out and do the miracles that Jesus told us we could do. The miracles of healing the sick, bringing justice to the world, and enabling those who still feel in our world today that they are less than, that they are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. This series of the underdogs, I'm sure, will reveal some great things for us over the next few weeks, and I encourage you to come back. And if you consider yourself an underdog this evening, then know you're in the right place, because God has just turned you upside down and hopefully has reminded you this evening that you are not worthless, but you are worth everything, because the love of God is within you. May we be encouraged this night to continue to be a blessing to this world. God bless you, Cathedral of Hope, and amen.